welcome back to another episode of Crux Fibers. This is a knitting podcast, and if this is your first time viewing, welcome. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so happy to be um, on schedule with podcasting. The last one was delayed a bit, but alas, here we are. So thanks so much for coming. Um, I usually start out by saying that I my name is Brittany, and I am from White Horse Yukon, which is the traditional territory of the Tahoe and Gritchen and the Kwanlandan First Nations. And I was born and raised here. My husband was born and raised in the Yukon, and my children are born and raised. So it's really wonderful to be part of a wonderful legacy here of things that will creep out, creep, um, that will trickle, emerge out during these podcasts about lifestyle here um, and yeah, all the woolly things. I am holding our Angora, our satin Angora bunny, and I'm currently smelling my coffee and smelling my sourdough bread baking right now. So if you know me on the social medias, you know that I'm a sourdough baker and uh, love it love sourdough um, and so at some point when my timer goes I will have to go and take off the lids from my Dutch oven and maybe I will show you then what it looks like or I'll show you at the end what my lovely sourdough can look to be so also in the last episode I started out talking about the bunny and how it was a boy and it was named was Angus but actually we've discovered that Angus is actually a girl so we now say Agnes. Angus sometimes comes out, uh, sometimes we say he, sometimes we say she, and then I was like, maybe our bunny's just non-binary. <laughs> but anyways, she is so fluffy. I don't remember if she was as fluffy as the last time, but I've been able to collect some of the fluff gently off of her. I have, um, I have a comb that I comb her and make sure she doesn't get matted because she's really, really fluffy. And she has the red eyes, which some people don't really like. But here we go. There's Agnes. She's super playful. And she and our cat are like best friends. They get on really well. And right now she's probably thinking, why are you holding me? I'm super, super hot. But she likes bum scratches. And she eats all of the veggies. And because she's a wool provider, guess what I did? I collected some of the wool and I blended it with sheep wool. Look at this. I'm gonna put the bunny down. Hi, your nails are on me. And let's see if we can zoom in a bit better. There we go, look at that, isn't that beautiful? So the wool in here is from my friend Melly Knits on Instagram. She's a really good friend of mine and um, she rescues uh, burn pile fleeces from within the BC area that she lives. So fleeces that would be sheared from animals that are bred for their meat and then often the fleeces just get thrown into a, a burn pile and burned. So it's like really beautiful wool in this that, that she rescued and um, I believe she scoured and then she sent it off to a, a lady who has a massive carter and she carded it and she this stuff is a dream to spin. It's just a mix of all these different fleeces. It is, oh, such a dream. And if you're used to spinning at a spinning wheel, it is so good to spin. You can one hand it, pull it back, one hand it. So, so with all of the fluff from Agnes that I collected, I, I got about if, no 10 grams of her fluff and blended it with about 12 grams of wool. In the end, this weighs 62 grams. So I know I got roughly about 10 grams of her of her fluff, and it's not very long right now, and I think she's gonna get longer, but she's feeling really thick. So I think she's actually almost ready to completely shed. I don't know, I need to do some more research, but if you guys have Vangora bunnies, and you know how they, when and how they shed, apparently every three to four months, let me know. I would love to know how to make sure I don't harm this bunny but sometimes when I comb her, she'll twitch a bit. It might just be because it's a new thing. But she loves us. She gives us kisses. And she gets up to some mischief here and there. She does a few little bunny hops. They're super cute. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, I think I said she's a satin angora, satin cross angora bunny. So if you know what satin is, it's pretty shimmery and shiny. So this yarn turned out, um, you know, fairly lustrous for only having 15% angora. See, I'm very happy. I'm gonna put Agnes down so she can cool off. She's a big fluster. I think sitting on me, she's gonna get really hot. So um, I am wearing a shawl that I knit with my hand spun yarn and they are from uh, wool blends that I created. There's actually two different yarns in here. There's one with the, like, the rusty color and one with the more deeper blue color. And this is just a plain old garter stitch. But um, the shawl is sort of like a, like a, um, like a, a kite or not quite, it's not um, a crescent, but it's more like a kite shape. Andrew Mary and others often like design shells with this kind of shape where you have increases um, on, you start here. And so you increase up the middle and you, um, sorry, you decrease in the middle and you increase on the outsides and you go, go, go until you have about half of your yarn and then you start your decreases but you keep sorry yeah you keep your um you keep your decreases along the bias the same and then you increase one side and decrease another i think that's how it is but anyways this is actually a um a shawl recipe by artifacts of appreciation so lindsay on on instagram she on her website has this recipe and it's really it's really easy very very easy mindful knitting and a perfect for hands one because of the garter Stitches. But yeah, so some subtle striping. This is the kind of striping I like. I like it being um, subtle. That's what I'm wearing. And I have some finished objects, like I do every episode. I always have finished objects. I don't rush myself, but I, I'm a fairly, yeah, I love to knit. I knit all the time. Something, I always have to do something with my hands. So I have finished two garments. And a bucket <laughs> and two boo-boo buddies which I forgot in the freezer so at one point I will go get them I'm gonna pause and go get them because they're super cute and I have to tell you all about them <laughs> so let's start with the Ginny cardigan so the Ginny cardigan I've shown a few times on here and and it is in the Knit Rennie, or JC Rennie cones from Scotland. The links will be below. There goes my coffee maker. Um, and the Ginny cardigan was designed for, um, it's named after Andrew Mowry's um, uh, grandmother, I think. And you know what? I think I might as well just put this on so that you guys can see how it fits. So um, the only modifications I did to this was I steeped it. Um, if you don't know what steeking is, it means instead of knitting back and forth, you're gonna knit in the round and add some extra stitches down a panel of the garment and then um, you can prepare it for steeking, which is the cutting of your fabric, which most people, a lot of knitters freak out about. But if you are very much comfortable with knitting with wooly wool and wools that have um, grippy fibers, then steeking is no problem. So. I have not done the let's try to, have not done the 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 belt because I didn't know if I wanted one and so the steaking happened um, this was where I knit to and a few stitches in so you can see here this is the cut side and I the only reinforcing that I did before steaking was I needle felted so I had this uh, wooden handle that had about 10 different needles in it Here's the other side so it's holding up I've just needle felted it and with blocking these woolen sh Shetland uh, it's like, I think it's a lamb's piece a lamb Shetland blend I can't quite remember links will be below in the colorway um, smolder and yeah, 
I am um, the other thing I modified was instead of knitting to about my natural waist with I think about the natural waist instead of knitting to there for this um, for the collar with when you pick up and keep knitting back and forth to create this this collar instead of going the the length it called for which was so here's is where the steak began instead of going past there I just ended about here and then I then I um, continue knitting until I had about three inches ish across there so I think I'm gonna either buy a belt for this or knit the, the belt um, because when I stand okay it's, it's falling pretty even now but often it will fall down and not be very straight but otherwise this is a really beautiful fabric very very beautiful um, and it softens right up now if you know about these cones they're called greasy cones and they are specifically for using in knitting machines or they're just mill ends um, and they're still in the grease meaning the grease that they use to send the, the wool through their machines so that they machines don't build up and I'm not quite sure why so that the fibers don't build up or they something to do with helping the spinning um, but it smells like petrol or something not quite so you have to be mindful of when you knit with it and how long you knit with it it's suggested to knit with gloves but who wants to knit with gloves on so I just took my time knitting this I think I started it in February um, and to get the grease out I used power scour which is um, uh, a soap that you can use on practically anything you can get out ridiculous amount of stains it's very very strong and environmentally f friendly um, and fairly concentrated so what I did was I had my sink full of very hot water about 140 Celsius 140 Celsius <laughs> the hottest it could come out of my tap and then I poured in the power scour but I didn't agitate it too much so I wouldn't get suds and then I Put the cardigan um, it was dry and then I laid it on top of the hot water and just gently pushed it down until it was fully submerged and and I would go back and check on it and push it back down um, after that sat for about 20 30 minutes then I drained it pulled it out I, re I like squeezed it out and then I refilled the sink with the same temperature of water and resubmerged it and then I left it until the water fully cooled and then again drained um, and then I put it in my spin dryer so and it came out perfectly fine yeah I held this yarn two strands um, and it is incredibly cozy I don't want to take it off now I've got the air conditioning on so it's pretty hot here in the Yukon right now so um, I should before I carry on say there were, I put out a call on Instagram for some questions for me to answer so I plan to get to those so I don't have a ton to show um, but there's always lots to talk about for some reason so yeah I love this pattern I have knit a few of Andrea Mallory patterns they work well with my body type I like the more bossy shape the more loose fitting I just feel most comfortable with them so I knit this on the recommended needles and got gauge and it fits perfectly fine yeah the only thing is I I think I need that belt because often sometimes this wants to pull off Maybe it's a fit issue, I'm not sure. And I got multiple layers on here. So yeah, I might either buy a belt so that it looks just accessorized, I don't know. Or I might just leave it. I don't go out too much, so I don't really feel like I need to accessorize much in this space. But I love this yarn. It's, yeah. So there you go. That is the Ginny cardigan by Andrea Mallory. Ta -da! The next finished object I'd love to show you is another uh, pullover that I test knit for uh, Anna from the Blue Bird Box. I've probably talked about her in every episode because I have test knit multiple of her, multiples of her patterns and I love her patterns. She's really lovely, um, has some really 
wonderful aesthetic in her designs and writes them very well. She's incredible with numbers <laughs> as your test knitting. And the test knitting for her is really fun. You do, it gets hosted in um, a Slack channel and it's hosted like um, um, a knit along, a mystery knit along. So you get sections of the pattern and then once you complete that, then you get the next section. So you have enough information that, to get your gauge and know what techniques you're using. But it's super fun. So I showed this the last time I was working on it. I think a few, I showed it once or twice. It is an absolutely wonderful pattern. So if you know the bubble stitch, what's called the bubble stitch, um, then you can knit this. I knit it in uh, Nutidin yarn in the colorway Tall Bark, and I held it double strand, and I had 500 grams. I used all but a, but a ball this size. I used all, double, all of it, but a ball this size. <laughs> and as I was knitting, um, this is Nutidin, so it's like unspun. Uh, it's this is what would be considered woolen prepped and then it gets a twist so that's like how the the other cardigans yarn is so it's very airy and then gets a twist and then gets applied but Nutidin they just put it through the mill and it comes out as a strand like this very airy very light so a sweater that would hold for my size almost 500 grams could weigh a lot if it was a spun yarn but because it's not spun and there's lots of air space requires less wool to create that gauge of yarn um yeah i love knitting with this stuff especially in the north i wish i could have my own canadian unspun yarn um like this and yeah it called for a certain needle size and i went down to a 3.5 for the body but for the arms i did three points seven five millimeters I believe I'll have it up on my Ravelry page for when the pattern launches I think maybe in July sometime I'll stand up and show you but first I need to take the lids off my bread all right I'm gonna stand up so you can see the body it's a boxy shape it is knit bottom up as well as the sleeves are knit from bottom up and it is knit entirely inside out. So you knit it with this side out. And then when you're ready to assemble, then you turn your sleeves inside out. Um, and carry on. She's got some really wonderful suggestions on how to make sure that the yoke fits because for the body, you have to make sure you get your row gauge. So, instead of using my net metal needles, like my Chiago, I went to my driftwood needles and got my, I got my stitch gauge for the arms in the 3.75 millimeter needles, but for the body I couldn't get the row gauge, so I went down to a 3.5, and then I also was pre-drafting the two strands of the Nutidin just to get the thickness of this fabric a little... Um, less dense and then I can get the row gauge and it came out perfect just perfect so this looks like a lattice um, like lattice just going up you know like lattice on the fence or but the underside is these these bubble stitches so that's that's done with um, knitting a certain amount of stitches below and making sure that the strands unravel and then pulling it tight and it's pulling that tight that's really key to create the, the bubbling effect and then so yeah that's how you get this beautiful uh, reverse stockinette stitching um, yeah, I'm in love with it there's a twisted rib raglan increase so yeah again knit bottom up um, I suggest grabbing a sweater from your closet that you know that you like the length on and then when you knit the body to knit the body that length 
and you could check the yoke depth on that sweater and compare it to the charts of this one to see if you can get the body enough or other people will often do like a provisional cast on with the body and so they'll knit like less ribbing and then with a provisional cast on then you can pick it back up and finish a little bit more knitting so those are some suggestions i have knit a few bottom up sweaters so i don't think you should be um nervous about that <laughs> So, moving on, her husband just got home and now I'm shy, he's going to go hide away, right? <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do, I didn't think he'd be home soon, so anyway. All right, I'm just gonna put this cooler cardigan back on. Um, and then the next finished object I wanted to show you before we get on to the boo-boo the buddies is last time I also was showing you this, um, this uh, basket by Vanessa Paisa. I don't know if it's Paisa or Paisa. Uh, it's probably Paisa, just I don't think she I always forget where she is. If she's in a Spanish country in, in Europe, then it's Pisa, I think. Or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so this is the Bocaria or Bocaria basket. This is knit with a linen stitch. And I used again Nutidin in the colorways Lunette and Golem. So this is the bottom panel, which I ended up needle felting just to give it a little bit more structure. I think as I was knitting, I was getting looser in my gauge. So it's holding right now a sock whip and a few things. And it's some I-cord edging along here. It's really fun to make. I really, really love making this and I want to make another one, but I have some things I have to get done first. But again, like I, whenever I do eye cord edging, I always do them too loose. I even try, I try. But this time I didn't do what I was planning on doing. I did not go down a needle size. So I think the next time I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down a needle size for the eye cord edging so that I don't have this rolling. So because I had so much rolling, I went and then I needle felted around here and around there and actually on the on the eye cord edging. It doesn't even look like it's been needle felted. Hello. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's been needle felted at all. But yeah, so with like an unspun yarn held double, I mean, it's holding a good amount in here. Let me just add some more weight. Da, da, da. Maybe a bag of beads. <laughs> and here we go. See, it just looks super cute. And it's bouncy. Yeah, it's lovely. I look forward to knitting another one. So yeah, very much recommended. I think Vanessa is actually doing a cal right now, which I had intended on casting on for. And I might still do that. My yarn is ready and it was going to be a gift for a friend. And uh, yeah. So, Lindsay, I guess I could only find one. I made two. So maybe I'll pop in a photo at the end. But so this is called Bow the Turtle, and my friend Eden from Crack and Made, Crafting Crack and Made, on Instagram, designed this cute crocheted turtle. So you knit the body, and then you knit flat the, the heads the feet. I made a little tail. I don't know. I just felt like I wanted to add a tail. So I think her pattern suggests like you can do it, but she didn't originally write it with one. So I tested it. I t test. How do you say that? Crochet tested her, uh, her bow, the turtle. And so I guess apparently when she grew up, she called these boo boo buddies when she was a kid because they're full of beans and then they hang out in the freezer. And if your kid gets a bit of a boo-boo and you need a bit of a chill, then this is just like a nice temperature for them. It's not too, too cold. It's not a bunch of cold plastic you're putting on their boo-boos. 
But yeah, it was a really well-written crochet pattern. Um, all you need to know how to do is uh, to chain. Um, there's no double crochet, there's just single crochet. And you use a three millimeter crochet needle. And I use that for both. Um, my second one, I think, was a little bit smaller. It was a bit tighter in the gauge. So I used some just stash yarn. And the other one, which I, <laughs> I wish I had to show you, was um, made in Eden's hand dyed yarn in her colorway. I showed, I showed it at the end of the last podcast. In the colorway um, Watercolor Promises. And I was just checking the other day. I think she still has a sock set. And I highly recommend getting it because it's a really beautiful, beautiful yarn. It's a super washed, so I think it's a 75-25 merino nylon. Um, but it is a yarn that is, I think, from actually Ashford. So it's got more of a toothiness to it, which is nice for a, a, um, a super washed yarn. So it's got some softness, but like a halo, not this one. Anyways. So that's all my finished objects, hey guys. Um, I want to show you some camisoles that I casted on this week in my hand dyed yarn that I'll be bringing with me to Knit City as one of my new yarn bases. Um, I'm holding this first one in a Camp Yukon bag. Camp Yukon is from here. Her last name is, or Becky Camp. And this has got the buffalo plaid. Here's your little show notes there. Camp Yukon, and she even makes these little lanyard things so you can take them off. I've used these for holding my keys, and it's holding a, it's just not really like a ton to show here. So this is upside down. <laughs> to knit top down, you knit these uh, little triangles. So this is the front, this is the one that will be covering your chest, and then this is the little triangle back. <laughs> uh, the back part and so I've already joined in a round and um, losing some stitches and now it's just sort of knitting for the body and then I think that's what it I don't I didn't read ahead to what the cast off is um, but it's a really nice pattern I like especially this one I like where the increases are um, right here the increases are here and I cord edging. This is in my hand dyed yarn. I haven't given this a colorway name yet. It's a silk linen blend. It's 65% silk, 35% linen. It's very, very soft and slick. Uh, it's very nice in this camisole and I cannot wait to wear this. Um, I am knitting these samples so I can bring them to Knit City with me to show how the fabric looks in these kinds of garments or camisoles. Yeah, it's a lovely pattern. It's The designer is called Kadri and the pattern, which you're probably wondering, is called the Svilla camisole, so I'll put that down below. Um, yeah, I, I've actually never knit a garment with this kind of yarn before, uh, and I was wondering about how do I how do I take care of the ends? Because it's not wool, it's going to be slick. And she keeps saying in the pattern, like when you join certain things or start something new, make sure your work is neat. And I'm like, well, how do you make sure something is neat with a yarn that has no stretch? Like, nil, guys, it's a nil. You can weave with this. Um, so I did a quick Google search, as you do, and learned that the best way to, to weave in ends of any sort of get out of there plant-based um, yarn is to duplicate stitch so duplicate stitch is where you take your darning needle and you follow the stitches through you know your knit stitches come on you follow through and uh, it's practically yeah invi invisible I'll show you where I did some so here on the joins of the back One sec. Right there, there's duplicate stitches all along here. You can't tell. And when I've been pulling on it, it's not undoing at all because there's just too much for the, the yarn to be woven through. So instead of like 
going through your umbrella and mountains, I think people call them, when they're weaving in their ends, you do it on your right side. I don't know if I've done it right, but that's what I did and it looked good and I'm, I'm happy. So yeah, this is the Spilla Camisole by Kadri. She's got a bunch of different patterns and a lovely Instagram feed. Um, fairly, I think, size inclusive. I think this goes up to 5X, 4XL. Uh, a bit unsure of the actual sizes. Um, yeah. I don't know much about the designer at all. Um, and because this is silk linen, oof, you don't want to cake it. You want to hand wind it because this has no stretch it has no toothiness like wool has so it just falls off of your ball winder and makes a mess and a big headache so i'm excited about this yarn there's maybe something in the works as far as design goes with someone and if that goes through you will be you will know um yeah so let me know what you think about silk linen yarn and if you'd ever work with it i really like it it's very soft in the hands and not stiff to work with at all. With that high percentage of silk to linen, it's it's nice. On the other spectrum side of silk and linen, I have another yarn base that's more rustic. Um, this is beautiful. This is 45% baby alpaca. Uh, I think 35, I'm just going to do my math right, 30, I don't know, I'll put it down below. Uh, it's definitely 45% baby alpaca, and then there's uh, linen, and then Tessa silk. Tessa silk is just a different variety of a silkworm, and their silk is not mulberry silk. It doesn't get really, really long threaded, and it's not as silky, it's more rustic. Um... And dyes differently. It's more muted. It's not as it's not like if you're looking at this, you don't see a sheen. So it's definitely more rustic. But this is not itchy. The what you're seeing with the the white flecks, that's the linen. The linen is plant, so it's not going to take the acid dyes. Whereas the silk and the alpaca will take on the dyes. Alpaca mutes color. So so this is this in uh, Hank skein form. Probably looking a little bit more orange on the screen, but it's oh yeah, it's very rusty. This is this colorway is called Beaver Lodge. Do you want to see Beaver Lodge on Chevrolet? Chevrolet. <laughs> oh dear, we're having a real one today. Okay, North Country Cheviot and Texel. Those are two different sheep breeds you can find here in Canada. I have spun Cheviot, not North Country Cheviot. I don't remember if they are the same. And Texel, I have not spun as well. So it is a lot more vibrant, wouldn't you say, than this. The exact same colorway, and I do the math to figure out the weight to the dye percentages I need. Uh, this is a woolen spun yarn. It would probably look a lot darker if it was worsted spun, because there would be no airspace between all the fibers. But this is woolen, so it's very squishy. There's a lot of air space in between all of the all of the plies, the singles to the plies. And yeah, it's looking really orange on the screen, but it's a bit more cognac, rusty brown. My favorite. And then I also dyed it on, I've dyed it on my BFL yarn base, and I've also dyed it on this Dorset. So pretty close. Between the Dorset and the Cheviot, they're pretty similar fibers, I would say. I think Dorset is more, more uh, maybe a stiffer yarn. I don't know. I don't. They're. I think they're similar sheep, similar fiber producers, and they're taking on the dye pretty similar too. But these are different yarn gauges, yarn um, weights. So this is a uh, the DK, to, uh, maybe heavy DK, and then this is a singles about fingering weight to sport weight. And I'm knitting a sock because this yarn is so good in socks. You wouldn't think a singles would be nice in a sock, but my classic toe up 
uh, self-drafted recipe. I'm just adding some details, and this is just another um, another sock that, or another object I'm making for the Knit City that I will be vending at. So yeah, it's just, this is also wool and spun yarn, but because it's Dorset, it's just a lot more durable, uh, strong, thermal, pretty warm, and then we get to see what this colorway looks like knitted up. So yeah, I think that's my final work in progress that I've actually actively been working on this past month. And um, the other thing, I should have started out talking about it with that hand spun I just showed you. I just spun and ply that today. No, I don't rest my singles if you are a spinner. <laughs> Not really, unless there's a specific project I need something specific for. Um, so after you're done spinning your, your singles, you often leave them on your bobbin and let them rest for 24 plus hours to let the energy and the fibers to relax. So you have an easier time handling the yarn for plying, but it was fine for me. So anyways, I am participating in the Tour de Fleece, which is running, cycling alongside the Tour de France. Tour de France. And I have a team called the Stash Dashers. Um, and so I'm gonna just spin away at some stash so I don't dash my stash anymore. Um, I don't have a huge stash, but it can, it can build up if I keep, you know, yeah. I don't remember the fiber content in this. There's, let me think, there. Okay, so rose, one of the fleeces I process, some Yukon alpaca, and... All right, no, CVMs, uh, Rommeldale, not really Rommeldale, CVM, that's the US, but sourced in Canada. Um, so rose, which is white, CVM, which is that creamy, the lighter cream color, and then that more uh, auburn color is alpaca mixed with silk that comes from Wellington Fibers, Wellington Fiber Mill, the mill that I used to get my um, yarn spun. Uh, Oh, and some hand-dyed merino, merino from Akari Yarns. So I'm planning on spinning this because I could only create one and it's just too beautiful and it's going to be heathered and lovely and the colors and tones I absolutely adore. I mean, right? Come on. <laughs> Practically the same thing here. So this is about 100 grams. I don't know how I'm going to spin it. Probably just spin it however it wants to. I just let it speak to me. Hi, Agnes. Bunnies might say hi again. So yeah, that is um, one of the things I'll be spinning. I will be spinning Tor Falls Fleece as well for the DRK Spin It to Knit It with Andrea Mallory. Um, I've donated a prize for that um, for that knit along. Or uh, what do you call it? Like spin along, knit along. And so I've donated a prize for that. And so yeah, if you participate, you could potentially win a braid of hand dyed merino wool <laughs> um what else will i be spinning i got i've got a fractal spin i started i should probably finish that maybe i don't know we'll see i just i have fiber prepared for spinning but torfall is the biggest one he's got a he's a big project because he he's gonna be a my next sweater hopefully the the weekend or late so yeah, that is all the things I wanted to show you. And then for now, if this doesn't interest you, um, I will see you next time. I don't have any acquisitions. I often don't really show acquisitions because I like to show them in projects. So yeah, uh, I would like to answer some questions that I was asked that you want to know about. Um, One question was, um, actually, I'll start with this one. What's my fiber story? What made, me, what made me fall in love with fiber? It's a very good question. I think sometimes I forget some of these things or how I started. I, um, <laughs> funny, funny is distracting me. I first started spinning, oh, I think coming up on three years ago now, I, I, I got a drop spindle uh, from, it's Bitsy Yarn Store. I think while I chat with you, I might knit. So my hands always have to do something. Uh, 
and that spindle was a pretty heavy one. I I think because I had all this fiber and I wanted I didn't know what to do with it. I knew there was 100 grams and we all know that most skeins come in about 100 grams and 100 grams often only means one project or something. So I just I was trying to spin it and um, it came out thicker. I'll show uh, a picture of it in the sort of the credits at the end of this video. And it, it was okay. It was a pretty classic first time spinning hands one. <laughs> it was the braid was blue and green and white and I had no idea about color management um, with hand dyed fiber. So I just kind of went from tip to tip I think or was breaking off chunks or stripping down trunk chunks so if I, I don't I even knit with it I probably should do a little like coffee coaster or something. That's where I started and the love of the fiber I think it came from Nora's fleece. Uh, because after spinning those the spindles, I, the only other fiber I was trying to spin was a merino silk Ashford blend. And if you're new to spinning, that is probably the worst kind of fiber to start spinning on a drop spindle because there's so many, thank you, so many different variables that affect um, your ability to spin on a drop spindle, let alone a like 50 gram spindle that's heavy. I would say it weighed about 50 grams or more. And yeah, so processing Nora's fleece, spinning it, and then knitting a sweater out of it, I just had this immense amount of appreciation that like one, hi Agnes, one uh, <laughs> silly bunny, I got her. Um, I had an immense amount of just appreciation for that, for that, um, that sheep that she, lived and breathed and her purpose is to provide fiber and I just had a lot of respect for her and I learned more about the shepherd Sierra who has a wonderful flock of Gotland cross BFL sheep um, her new lambs are a higher percentage BFL and then Gotland in the bloodline so their fleeces are really stunning so stunning um, the sire to all of the lambs are Torfall <laughs> and with Nora, they had a um, a ram who I was like, can he be my fiber weather? <laughs> so he's going to produce some fiber for me every year. I get his fleece, I get Nora's fleece, I get Torfall's fleece, and whatever. I get, I get some first dibs on some fleeces because I'm consistently supporting her flock. And so that's where my love of fiber came. And then... Uh, I think actually before that I was also delving into breed specific from Longway Homestead so Anna introduced the breed specific monthly club so you could either sign up to get the yarn or the fiber and I signed up to get the fiber and so uh, the first few months I got I was polypay BFL Cheviot, I think I got three. I might have only got two. I can't remember. And I was spinning them, and I just couldn't keep up with it. My skill level was lower, and I couldn't spin as fast, and I didn't have as much knowledge. So I discontinued the subscription and decided to. Uh, I discontinued the subscription, and then I got Nora's fleece, and I learned a whole lot trying to process Nora's fleece. I learned about overspinning and what that can do with biasing in the fabric because my sweater came out with biasing, which I showed in previous episodes. Um, yeah, and then and then I resubscribed to the subscription because I wanted to f try out some different breed, uh, different wool for different breeds, um, and learn more about the Canadian wool industry. And that is the long way homestead is really what kicked me in gear with learning more about wool in Canada and how what happens it just burn piles and and our government could be supporting our farmers more helping them produce more wool in Canada so that it's more accessible than us having to import as dyers 
Um, yeah, so I have a focus on Canadian wool with my business. And um, even so, I have a focus on using Canadian wool, not just Canadian wool, because I like to learn things as well and I like to enjoy things from other countries as well. There's nothing wrong with that. So I treat myself to all sorts of things and live in Canada and spin my own yarn and all that stuff. So <sighs> passionate about wool. It's funny. Angora wool. She's shedding. Not entirely. Anyways, so yeah, that's where my passion for it came from. And um, one of the other questions was, how do I practice slow and mindful living? Uh, if that is the perception I give on social media, I apologize. I do not have just slow and mindful living. Um, but I, I think I'm not slow. Maybe I am. I don't know. It's a really good question. I maybe need to think more about it, but how do I practice that? I think allowing space to think. Maybe. It's a really good question. I think a good question for everybody. I think the biggest thing is time. Giving your yourself the time and the space to either practice something uh, with the spinning, um, lifestyle choices as well. I l really love getting into things that are technical. That's why I bake sourdough. It's, I don't know, everything that I seem to be getting my hands into are very technical and I could focus. And so maybe I like things that give me a, an immense amount of focus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I don't know if that's really an answer to the question, but I hope it's at least an insight into more of my background. And I was also asked um, if I've worked with Angora fiber before. I've only knit with Angora, like 100% Angora. I knit this hat and I don't know where it is. I don't even know if I still have it. So I've knit with it and then as of yet, I've just spun with it, but it's only 15% of Agnes's uh, fur. So not much. And then ideas for fluffy possibilities was part of the other was part of that question was, well, there's tons of possibilities with fluff, and I think the question I don't know if it's just meant to do with our angora bunny, but um, I do not plan on breeding rabbits. I don't have time for that. I plan on keeping Agnes in our family and loving her as long as she'll live, and maybe getting another bunny someday. I don't know. But life happens, and I would love a country residential house someday so that I could have maybe my own bunnies, maybe my own sheep. Possibilities are really endless. It's just a matter of, is it right for now? Uh, another question I was asked was, how do you get rid of um, veg matter in fiber? So when you get a fleece, these animals live and they breed in the wild or in, in a field, a pasture. Um, and they eat hay, they eat and they forage off the land and their fleece, their fiber, even Agnes here will get hay stuck in her. And so like, how do you get rid of that when you have a whole fleece or maybe you're given some of it and, or maybe it's even kind of processed and it still has veg matter in it. Veg matter we shorten by saying VM. So there's, if it's in there, it's in there. Uh, if it's a lot, there are different ways of processing fiber that you can get rid of it. Um, combing are, is one way. Carding, I'll just show you this. This is a hand carter with some bison on it <laughs> from Alberta. This is bison Alberta, not Yukon. And these carters, when you keep carding, um, f veg matter will fall out. Um, if it's a long fiber and you're trying to cart it, those fibers might Sorry, that veg matter might hang out in the fiber a little easier, whereas if it's shorter fibers, it could fall out better. But in my experience so far with my own hand processing, hand combing uh, fiber will cause the veg matter to fall out more. You'll have less of it. It also will um, take away any neps and noils and create a nice combed fiber for worsted spinning. 
So if that was you wanting to know that answer, that is my suggestion is combing. Um, also just spinning is going to cause veg matter to fall out. The only other method for getting rid of veg matter is using a chemical and allowing it to dry and then crushing the wool, like rolling the roll, rolling the wool to cause the veg matter to, matter to turn into powder. And that is how in, um, large mills and mass producing yarn producers, wool producers, yarn producers, uh, get rid of veg matter, but it's using a chemical that isn't, um, that is harmful to our uh, water systems. So really with the veg matter, just do your best, um, skirt your best with the fleece, cart it, comb it, whatever tools you have. If you don't have combs, they are very expensive. Those are an older tool. Uh, carting is a newer industrialized method of processing fiber. And when I use a drum carter and I put make a bat, what I do instead of just um, splitting it, okay, you can go down. <laughs> instead of splitting the bat in half or multiples and then trying to put it through the carter, I actually split it. I don't even have a bat to show you. I do, sorry. This bat here, if I wanted to get more veg matter out of it, instead of splitting it this way, I would turn it this way. Actually, you could split it that way first and then you want to peel the layers apart and then put it back through a drum carter. If you are somehow able to get layers in your carding and then you peel the, the layers apart, veg matter will fall out. And then you can also shake it out. So that is another way I've been able to get a lot of veg matter out. So yeah, I think those were all of the questions in the last episode. Someone did ask about lifestyle here. I feel like I did cover some of it. Um, my husband and I, we are um, hunters. I have my business, Crux Fibers, um, and we have another business called Vote Homes. So we build spec homes, and I think I've covered this before in the podcast, but if you are new, we are house builders. And yeah, so those, those are our jobs. And then lifestyle-wise, what do we do? John loves to, I don't often, I haven't been able to get out to do this since we were um, newly married, but uh, sheep hunting is a lot of walking. It's not about summiting mountains or anything. It's just about walking over the hills and following the herd. And John is allowed to hunt one mountain sheep a year. He's had one in his life. It's, uh, it's, a, hard, it's a hard hunt and it should be. So <laughs> that, and he buys and hunts, and we fish. We love to get out on the boat and fish. I shared that at the end of the last last podcast. And otherwise, we just, you know, camp. I think as a young family, we haven't really um, had much time to do all that much. But here in the north, I don't know. It's just, it's colder. You get used to the climate. Life is just, I guess, normal the way it is. So maybe to answer some more questions about lifestyle up here, I might need a little bit more specific questions. Um, we have some different holidays up here that you can check out. We just had the Aboriginal Day, um, which is an actual holiday here where we get the day off. Um, obviously, it's Canada Day today. Uh, and we also celebrate something called Rendezvous and um, Discovery Day. So those are some territorial holidays that we celebrate. And this weekend for our First Nations, there is a festival called the Attica Cultural Festival. It is the 10th year and they have some people from all over Canada in the from indigenous communities that have come up to share parts of their culture with music with um, traditional ceremonial wear um, did I say music yeah, art I'm sure lots of things to do with um, fur and yeah I'm excited we're gonna take the kids out I think Sunday to go um, to the festival to see what's going on so yeah I'm really excited about that anyways I think I have babbled on long enough 
if you do find that you enjoy this podcast, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I do read all of your comments and I try to um, reply to them all as well. And I'm getting not that close, but I'm getting closer to a thousand subscribers. So um, if, yeah, if that happens, I would love to do a giveaway or figure out some other way to have like a thank you, maybe like do a live or maybe do a Zoom knit night or something to celebrate. I don't know, like sometimes giveaways are okay, but it always just feels like one person only benefits and or gets something. So I don't know, maybe we could figure out something to to celebrate reaching a certain amount of subscribers. So yeah, I would like to thank you again so much for tuning in and <laughs> listening to me babble. I feel like I'm getting better at this. Um, and if you do have other questions or you want to know something specific, I highly suggest you quickly Google anything Yukon um, or just Google Yukon culture and if stuff that helps um, spike a, a, or spark a, a question, please pop them below or send me an email, send me a message on Instagram. I'd be happy to share more about Yuk here and my passion. Um, I talk a lot about wool that is not from the Yukon and I can chat a bit more about why there isn't a whole lot of Yukon wool, but there is a lot of possibilities, I think. So yeah, I look forward to catching up with you guys next time. So thank you and bye for now.